Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar, How to Secure Your Jupyter and Zeppelin Notebooks Using Zeppel. We're really excited to have with us Jonathan Sander, uh, Security Field CTO at Snowflake. He is a self-described philosopher turned technologist and has some great insight into how we can effectively uh, manage our uh, data science notebooks. We also have with us Zach Shainsky, uh, Solution Architect with Zeppel. You will receive a playback of this uh, webinar within the next day, and we've left some time at the end for a great Q&A, so please submit your questions in the chat box. And with that, I will hand it over to Jonathan. Thanks, Elise. All right, so um, let's begin at the beginning, and uh, we'll just talk through what we're gonna cover today. Uh, first, uh, we'll just talk a little bit about uh, data science and notebooks. Um, and uh, we'll get to uh, very quickly to the part where uh, my background comes in, which uh, is to discuss how you can have security breaches um, when you're using these notebooks if you don't do it well. Um, and then we'll move into how Zeppel has uh, built some pretty good solutions to that. And then hopefully um, we'll have some questions along the way and we'll get to them at the end and do a full Q&A session uh, moderated by our introducer. All right, so uh, with no further ado, uh, let's see, can I, nope, still can't start video, that's okay. Uh, you'll have to all trust that I'm, I'm a human and not an algorithm. Um, so, so for me, I'll begin where I sort of got into this notebook thing to start with. Um, and uh, first of all, um, I work at uh, Snowflake Computing and um, we are a data platform in the cloud, um, served up software as a service style, um, although it's a consumption model. And uh, clearly, um, tons of the people who are using Snowflake are um, very interested in uh, doing machine learning, especially, uh, which I think is where notebooks come in uh, very heavily, but also just collaborative coding and exploration of data and trying to turn data into valuable things for their companies. Um, now, the fact that I can say all the things I just said is a vast improvement over where I started my journey with this notebook um, concept because when I first joined Snowflake, I did so because of my security background and that's you know, still my role here. And I remember an early meeting where I was sitting there and people were talking about authentication with notebooks. And it was very confusing because quite literally in my head, um, what I was picturing was a notebook. Um, and you know, um, last I checked, uh, you know, there really wasn't any security for that other than perhaps something like this, it's these little locks that you have um, on a notebook. But uh, jokes aside, uh, you know, it just didn't make any sense. Um, and it just showed me I had a lot to learn. Um, so uh, after doing a lot of that learning, um, mostly uh, with my help, help from my customers, uh, I learned that notebooks are pretty interesting. Um, now, me, I'm a, uh, you know, uh, an old Unix hack, um, and uh, with apologies to all of those uh, Emacs uh, fans out there, my text editor of choice was always VI because I was a server side guy, VI yeah, was always installed. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't really have a chance to have an easy to use interface to do the stuff I was doing um, when I was, uh, you know, scripting and coding and um, getting things done with systems. And um, I had to deal with uh, basically black and white text, um, although these days uh, you, you, get, you get a little color in there uh, if you're on the Linux platform and you're lucky. Um, but, you know, regardless of what language I was using, um, I was using just a simple text editor. Notebooks with all these features of them. Um, this was this was sort of a, a, a totally new concept to me, um, and certainly I was you know I knew about IDEs, and these big you know, Visual Studio style things. But the notion that you could have a simple web-based, easy to use interface that you could use any language with um, that was brand new, um, and the fact that it was an open source world was kind of cool for me as well because I'm a big fan of uh, the open source world. So learning all that, um, of course, my brain started to immediately wonder, well, how can I break it? Um, you know, what, 
what's wrong with it? Um, you know, maybe that's sort of a, a disease, but that's that's what happens when you're a security person. Um, so you, even when you like something and you find it, your first thought is, well, you know, wh where, where can I find the flaws? What could be uh, what could be going wrong here? And, and by the way, it wasn't very hard to find that because right from that very first conversation, um, there was um, an immediate need <laughs> that was uh, clear because as I said, right, the first conversation involved the question authenticating with these notebooks. Um, and this turned out to be a pretty large and complex problem. Um, and if you're here, you probably don't need to be told that, right? That, uh, Managing your access to the underlying systems and platforms that you want to use um, while exploring your data um, using notebooks, um, it can get a little complex in the way that they're situated. Um, and uh, another thing that became apparent um, was that, you know, since notebooks live on laptops in a lot of cases, well, you know, a laptop is well known for being portable, I believe, right? Um, so the idea that uh, you could simply take these systems, the whole system that contained all of this uh, data exploration, um, basically IP, uh, and just walk off with it, that was an interesting uh, security challenge as well. Um, now, a lot of times, you know, systems are really complex to lock down this um, when you find these kind of problems. Um, but again, this is where open source comes in. Um, people were able to you know, dig in and start solving these problems because um, they can build on the excellent platforms um, that already existed and then surround them with stuff that people really need. So let's break each of these down, right? Let's, uh, let's go through both of them. Um, and I'm going to spend the majority of my time talking about this first one, the, the credential problem, because this is the one I kind of got obsessed with, because this is where my customers were asking me um, question after question. It all came down to a simple problem. Most of the time when people were using these notebooks, um, they were doing something like what we see here they would be forming a connection and writing the description of that connection, they would simply put their username and their password. Now, sometimes they were smart enough to put in, you know, a put password here or something along those lines and um, not leave their password in it. Um, but that obviously depended on um, them doing that right. And of course, um, one of the points, especially like, you know, if you start getting a little more mature and the, the notebooks might live um, on a server somewhere, well, okay, so fine. Now, now you've got lots of people's passwords potentially um, passing through um, this thing and all of them uh, perhaps have access to really juicy information. Um, but it only takes one mistake for someone to leave their password um, in there. Now, that could obviously be troublesome if you were going to uh, um, be sharing it just inside your um, company. Um, but we all know that that's not the only way that that happens these days, right? So um, you now have uh, the very, very um, famous um, set of problems. Well, you know, I'm not going to name names, but you can simply Google search for. Uh, Credentials on GitHub, or uh, you know, credentials on GitHub, or you know, keys or tokens on GitHub, um, and you will find um, lots of organizations have been popped um, simply because someone at the organization um, decided that they were going to um, try to do something good. By the way, right? Um, preserve and share their code, collaborate with people. These are all great concepts. Um, but when the code happens to contain a secret, password or token or something you need, um, that becomes dangerous, right? So um, this was the challenge that um, my customers were dealing with. And so it, it kind of set me on this path to try to solve it because um, in large part, that's what I do is I try to be proactive on the, the uh, um, my customers and solve these problems. So first thing I was going to do 
um, is what I always do is I, I, I try to get myself hands on. Um, I don't like theoretical problems in technology, um, despite um, the philosopher tag on my uh, LinkedIn that uh, was pulled out from my intro there. Um, I, I like my theory and my hobbies only. Um, in technology, I want things to be very solid. Um, so I wanted to build um, my own solution. That came down to um, building out um, Jupyter and Zeppelin environments, which turned out not to be quite as easy as I hoped. Um, so, you know, I, I was struggling a little bit to get a, a lab that, um, not, not a simple lab that just, you know, worked, but rather something that approximated what my customers were doing. Um, and that was turning out to be more effort than I thought. That led me to, to Zeppel. Um, and it was purely a coincidence. They, uh, they turned up at a Snowflake event, and I ended up talking to them about you know, the fact that I was working on this you know, security project. Um, and what I heard them say basically was, hey, I've got this notebook thing. It's in the cloud. You just set it up, and it works. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, and then it turned out to be exactly what I did not need. Um, and it's because it actually had already solved um, the problem I wanted to solve, right? So um, I wanted to set up a lab that was broken in the way that my customers were experiencing. And um, what I ended up with was uh, this thing in the cloud that already did what I wanted it to do. Um, you know, good for Zeppel, bad for me. Um, so I, I still, by the way, am uh, on, on, on Jupyter side, specifically Jupyter Hub, I'm still trying to figure out that lab, but that's uh, that's my problem now. Because um, what Zeppel did, right, is they took um, what we call Snowflake OAuth, uh, which is based on OAuth 2.0, uh, code grain flow. And, um, it allows you just a couple clicks, and we're gonna see this, by the way, to get to your information in Snowflake with your own personal credentials while literally exposing Nothing, and in fact, you can even use separation of keys, which is which I think is, to me is one of the most exciting parts. And we'll look at all of that. Um, and so, basically, that sort of suggests this differentiation, right? Where um, you have this idea that you know notebooks are an excellent thing, and they're going to increase productivity. The trouble is that if you do that you don't really have a good way to govern all of these things. And what I mean by govern is control the access, understand the access, perhaps authorize and approve the access ahead of time. Um, and certainly you're not gonna be in the realm of uh, you know, using your corporate standards if you're doing it that way, right? So you're gonna fall into that uh, shadow IP uh, world, which is, you know, the scary words that analysts use to make your um, boss's bosses very afraid of things like uh, open source software, which we don't want, right? Um, what's better is that you can take something like Zeppel, you still get the notebook experience, right? So it's still the same thing. Um, but instead of having, you know, this lack of governance, this, you know, shadow approach, this, you can use um, the uh, approved routes of authentication. You can use the mechanisms um, that exist to control um, how access should be granted. You can even start doing interesting things to network layers this way. So um, th this gives you a much better um, security footprint, but it doesn't really take anything away at the same time. So win-win you know, in that case. And the reason that's true, right, is that essentially all Zeppelin is doing is giving you the notebooks on the platform that you're already like, by the way. So you know, there's two major platforms, but they do them both. And everything that was good about those, having all the connectors that you want, using whatever language you want, using whatever library you want. That's all still there. Um, but you also get their centralized control management administration and most importantly for me, security. Um, and then that gets you access to the data in a more appropriate way. So that's the basic summary of uh, how, how I got to, to this place. Um, at this point, let, let's, let's look at some software. Um, so I need to switch up the share 
Don't mind the man behind the curtain for a moment. Uh, okay, so where's my browser? Here's my browser. Here we are. And go. All right. Hopefully now you are all seeing a Firefox browser. Um, if that's not the case, somebody come off mute and tell me. Um, but uh, what we're looking at here, um, hopefully everyone's familiar. Uh, this this is the Zeppel UI. This is my little lab in Zeppel that, uh, that I was granted. Um, and I really haven't done a lot to it, by the way. Um, I've just uh, been using it to test out the security thing. So what you're seeing is very close to what you'll see like the day you start your trial, because um, that's basically the mode I'm in. Um, so I come in here and I, they already built up a set of Snowflake um, access sort of out of the box, which is super cool, um, especially for folks like me that are not really Snowflake developers, right? I'm a security guy, just playing one on TV. Um, but as you can see, right, so this is exactly what you would expect, right? You have all of the capabilities of a normal notebook. You can put instructions in here. You can organize them into the different um, paragraphs that you're used to, um, and everything um, works that way. Here's the one we care about. Here's the interesting one, because this is the one that's got some code in it. Um, as you can see, I'm either preparing for this. I already ran this code. Um, and the most important part, right, is right here, right? We've got this built-in function, get data source, right? And it's saying get data source demo DB. Well, what that, what's that all about? Right? Um, so what it's doing is it's plugging into this Zeppel con construct of data sources. Um, and I've already got this demo DB um, data source defined here, which is cool. Um, but I want to sign in, right? I want, I want to be me in this. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and connect to Snowflake. Um, now, we're going to see how to set this up as well, um, but I'm just going to go through making it work first. When I click that, I get this other prompt. Now, this is a Snowflake prompt. If you've ever used Snowflake, you'll recognize it. Um, and I'm going to log in two different ways during this demo. Uh, first, I'm going to log in as just a user with the username and password. Um, and uh, shame on me, I don't have multi-factor turned on for this account. Um, that's just because I want to make this demo go faster. Um, so I'm successfully authenticated as Spider Gwen, if you're paying attention, that was the user. Uh, go ahead and save that. And now I'm in Jonathan, context. Yeah. Just really quick to note, um, maybe recap what, what happened on the screen when you clicked on Connect to Snowflake, because we only saw the browser window that you're sharing here uh, with, within this notebook. Oh, no. OK. Just, just that, maybe a walkthrough of what, what happened. So that, that's, some, that's some Zoom trickery there. Um, hmm. Yeah, so let, let me do this real quick. Uh, I am going to reorganize things super quick. You know, I practiced this demo just like a moment before we came on, but I could, of course, not practice the Zoom part of the demo. Uh, so let's try that again super quick. All right. So now you should be seeing the same browser, but this time you see the whole desktop. Yes? Zach, confirm, please. Confirmed, yep. Excellent. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that thing again. <laughs> click Connect Snowflake again. Um, this time, now you can see what I was talking about. This is that Snowflake screen that I was making reference to. Um, and here I go again um, using my password manager, which now you would actually also be able to see, um, to fill in the username and password. So I don't have multi-factor turned on, but I at least am using password manager. Um, and I have successfully authenticated. All right, so now we save that. Um, now, that was the normal Snowflake authentication, right? So now I'm logged in as that user Spider Gwen. And if I run this paragraph here, right, and I go, by the way, select uh, from my math public primes table, the first 2,000 um, prime numbers that are listed in that table. Um, very sensitive information, the first 2,000 primes in existence. Um, I get back all the results as I would expect, 
right? And, um, for you math mavens, um, you can check the index sequencing and numbers if you wish to, to, to validate that that's the case. Um, but what just happened, right? So I went to Snowflake, right? And I logged in. And by the way, just to get a look at that, I can go ahead, um, I'm now in my Snowflake worksheet, and I'm gonna ask Snowflake to tell me um, about the login history um, for the last day. And lo and behold, I see two logins for Spider-Gwen, uh, one after the other, basically right now. Um, the first was me logging in that little UI, right? So that authorized the connection um, that we had. And then the next, notice this, it says I logged in with the Python driver with an OAuth access token. That's the cool stuff that's going on in the background. That's what Zeppel built in was this OAuth support so that my Python code can log in as me um, with a negotiated token because I authorized that to happen as SpiderWeb. And that all happens because um, I created this security integration, um, which by the way, we'll see is uh, fully documented over in the Zeppel side, right? So you can actually um, get all of the um, instructions and how to do that from there, which by the way, um, also links to the Snowflake documentation if you wanna go deeper. Um, so all of that is there to help you. Um, but once you've created that, um, you can then extract the secrets from it, which I'm not gonna do in front of you people, um, but I'll show you where you're gonna put them if you were to set it up. Um, and then I can see that certain people um, have delegated um, the rights to that. So Spider Gwen has said, the Zeppel integration can use the public role as that user. Um, and then that's enabled, right? Importantly, we'll see that Black Panther is not yet enabled. So we'll, when we log in as Black Panther, we're gonna see that we have to do that interactively. Now, if I come back to um, the Zeppel side of things here, um, the reason this exists, um, and this is where this, this really cool separation of duties things come in. Um, the reason this exists is because some administrator will have created that for me. So a lot of the information that I need to do this will likely have been set up for me. And all I'm gonna to have to do is do that, auth that authentication. If I switch hats for a second, and I pretend that I am the administrator, and I have admin rights here in this little lab, um, I can do the add new, um, and I can add a Snowflake um, resource. Now, there's a lot of things I can um, set up in here. I'm not gonna set up anything, I'm just gonna show you a couple things, but um, the important thing is right here, this SSO right? Because that's what we want to use, right? Username and password, that's for the uncool kids. We're going to do the single sign-on. Um, this is where I need the client ID and the secret um, that I'm going to use. And that's what I was going to get if I ran this show secret statement back here. Again, I'm not going to do that and expose the secrets in front of y'all. But um, this is where I would use that to set this up. And if I did that, um, I would give it a name and it would be a new data source um, that I could use just like this demo DB, right? One other thing I wanna show you real quick um, is that if I wanna do single sign-on all the way through, right? I can go in here and let's say I wanna really reconnect to Snowflake, but this time I'm not gonna connect um, using a username and password. Uh, I'm instead gonna use this single sign-on routine. Um, and when I do that, it brings me in as Black Panther. Now you notice something, I didn't log in at all, right? Well, why? Because Black Panther was already logged into Okta. There's already a session. So if you were Black Panther, you would just click that, you would get to here. Um, and if this was your 500th time um, going and doing this, you wouldn't even see the screen I'm seeing now. The reason you're seeing the screen I'm seeing now is that Black Panther has not yet authorized Zeppel to use this role with this account and access data in Snowflake. Um, this is a step that is part of the OAuth um, authorization, um, and it's, you know, very similar to what you might see out on the internet um, some days when, you know, you're logging in with your you know, Google or Facebook account to do something, um, you'll see this authorization style screen as well. Same idea. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say allow, of course. Um, I now, of course, now logged in as Black Panther. Save that. Um, I can run this thing again. 
and it's going to go and grab that very secret sensitive information of the first 2000 prime numbers and map those out for me and if i go check it out here um first of all i can i can really quick look at my delegated authorizations and now i see that black panther has also allowed this zeppelin integration to act as that user. Uh, and if I go ahead and look at my login history, I'm going to see those same two types of things happening here, right? I've got Black Panther um, using a sample two assertion. Actually, I don't see that initial logon because I already had a session, right? So I didn't need to do that. Um, I just have that sample two assertion coming through and that's all that was necessary. Okay. So what have we learned, right? We've learned that you can come in here, um, your admins can set up the appropriate um, data sources for you and you can use um, single sign-on because it's built into Zeppel um, and you can even use the single sign-on from Snowflake inside of Zeppel um, and therefore end up with um, a, a fairly uh, great security model for authenticating, not having to put passwords um, into the system like that. So let's go ahead and shift back to our slides and move on to the next part of this story. Just a moment while we get those slides shared. Zach, that's your cue in case you're waiting. Jonathan, would you mind driving the slides for me? Um, and I'll let you know when to advance them. I can do that. Cool. Um, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm using a slightly older version of the slides you will want, but uh, I guess we'll live with that, huh? Um, so then let's go back here and I will share this. And if you want to swap into the presenter role at any time, you just say the word. Um, okay, so. Uh, where does that leave us, right? So the first problem was the authentication challenges. Um, the second was that these notebooks are stored on laptops. Um, these um, very hip, cool looking generic type icons are both possibly committing corporate crimes. Right there, they've got their um, laptops um, tucked under their arms. They're walking right out the door, and who knows where they're going? Um, laptops are portable, as we stated, and, and, and unfortunately, that means all the data on them is somewhat portable. Um, and who knows what can happen just at night, right? Because first of all, you know, maybe they're not committing crimes. Maybe they just leave the laptop in the back of a taxi. Maybe they have it swiped from the table at the coffee shop when they get up to grab the coffee as their name gets called. There's a lot of different scenarios here. People can just walk out of the company and um, you lose a lot of that collaboration spirit, by the way, when the thing lives on the notebook, but that's uh, the least of our problems in these scenarios. Um, we're worried about you know, the, the security of this. Um, and, and by the way, just to underscore this, I, I work with you know, some very large multinational um, financial and uh, pharmaceutical companies. And, and, and one of the, the latter actually did express a real concern over the fact that, you know, during that conversation about authentication, um, somebody brought up the point that, well, you know, even if we solve this authentication challenge, if these notebooks are on people's local systems and that means we can't lock them down, when they're doing their research, just the questions they're asking, the queries that they're doing, that is really valuable IP. It doesn't matter if the competitor can't see the results out of our database. Um, just the query itself tells them more than we want them to know, right? So um, clearly, right, um, there are definitely solutions to this. Zach, I think you, uh, I think you have some thoughts about that. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> um, so that, that example uh, that, that Jonathan just gave was a, was a major pharmaceutical company that we've been working with. And I was shocked to find out, and I, I don't know if, if you all would be shocked or horrified, but 
um, or, or shocked or not shocked about this, but there are roughly two thirds of data science notebooks that we've seen from major enterprises exist on local machines. And with that comes a lot of those natural challenges that, that, that Jonathan had, had just outlined. And this, this company actually had a, um, a, a real, a real security, uh, uh, real security risk that they were trying to patch that hole to where they had some employees leave the company without the knowledge of where their assets went. So that then brings us into, you know, how, how do we create a, both a secure and usable solution, right? But typically or oftentimes there's a, there's a balance or a scale between usability and security. And, and that scale and has to be, you know, has to be set based off of um, the solution that, that, that you choose as well as the risk profile of your organization. Well, the nice thing about having a, a solution like Zeppel on top of Snowflake is you get a lot of those centralization capabilities which lend themselves naturally to a more secure infrastructure, more security built around who can access what IP or what notebook, what model uh, might be running for your data science team. Um, but on top of that, and something that maybe we haven't quite addressed is also the concern around when we do start to centralize, um, we need to make sure that we have the right access controls in place. Uh, who is able to see what code or what results? Who's able to actually run those, those notebooks? Um, and so having a centralized managed platform like Zeppel and then giving secure authentication methods like Jonathan has shown us in his example, uh, along with um, a, a robust set of access controls around um, data, uh, uh, what data you're able to see, what data you're able to access, what code and results you're able to see, share internally and externally um, becomes a really compelling solution, both for security practitioners, as well as for your data science team, because now they can do their work without having to bother with checking with IT or checking with engineering or security groups uh, as to what processes they want to put in place uh, around their own specific workflow. And then the centralized, the centralized uh, platform, you know, really lends itself well for collaboration. And the, the, the goal here is to be secure and still be able to conduct business and iterate very quickly on building the mo models and data science outcomes or work that, that a lot of teams are, are approaching. And so we, we provide a lot of that collaboration across, across your teams. Um, a, a, another aspect that, uh, that lends itself really well to running workloads and data science notebooks on top of Zeppel is providing a standard way to run all of those uh, notebooks. So having a consistent software version and image that everybody shares <clears throat> in order to make sure that I can run uh, your code and you can run mine, as well as provide feedback and results based off of model improvement and accuracy is something that is really, really a uh, powerful way to iterate quickly for data science teams. Uh, and then lastly, you know, another added benefit here is being able to scale up and scale down resources uh, really quickly becomes a, 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 a bottleneck for data science teams as they start to grow and expand. Having to wait several weeks to provision um, larger in environments or procure hardware for larger uh, compute resources we, we've seen that be a big bottleneck for data science teams and, and, and a challenge or a solution, uh, a solution to that problem is, is having elastic resources which can scale up really easily in Zeppel. Jonathan, we go to the, the next slide here. So just, just finally, two, two, uh, two, two more slides here to, to wrap up and, and talk about you know, uh, a, a lot of the different features that, that we've mentioned here today. So, Dealing with um, a pre-built environment to maintain all of your assets, both inside of Zeppel, 
as well as all of the data and access control that you've built around Snowflake uh, exists in, in this technology stack that, that we're talking about and that Jonathan showed. We provide a lot of collaboration aspects that are both encourage uh, productivity within amongst the team, as well as uh, security. So making sure that only the, the, the right code gets run by the right people. And, and then finally, this all gets done through an approved system that has a single, um, you know, a single way to access the data, uh, as well as bring all of your, your data scientists into one place. And then to, to wrap up, you know, I, I, we, had a, we had a good question uh, in the chat right before Jonathan started to present, and it was around authentication and, and moving to uh, a single sign-on provider like Okta. Well, here are the three main areas that oftentimes this security conversation comes up when we're, we're working in the data science space. And a lot of the current tools in data science don't have or haven't quite put into thought uh, or these different security elements. So one is authentication. How do we get everybody onto a central platform and be able to securely authenticate and, and protect the assets that are there once they are? So we can provide single sign-on, username and password into authenticating into Zeppel. Uh, then on top of that, you'll, we, we, we provide access control. So what roles can, can, can access what resources and that permission is, is, is granular as far as our access controls go. And then lastly, of course, um, when, you're, when you're working with a, a centralized platform and you're, you're giving your data or your, uh, not your data, but your, your, your data science notebooks um, you know, to, to a third party or a vendor like Zeppel, you wanna make sure that those uh, assets are, are, are stored securely. And so we provide uh, data encryption, both in transit and at, at, and at rest. Uh, for, for all of the, the workloads that you might be running inside of Zeppel. You know, it's, it's funny, Zach, when I first saw this slide, I, I had to blink because I thought you might have stolen it out of our deck because um, uh, Snowflake does all these same things, right? So uh, it, it's kind of interesting. It's a, it's a good match um, in that sense. We take um, care to do all of these different things as well. Um, so it, you know, it does really um, line up the ideas about security between Zippel and Snowflake. So I guess that brings us to our final slide here. And I think that brings our host back on, I guess. Great. Yeah. And, and if, if there are any questions at this time, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we can, um, we can address them. And then, you know, more than happy to continue this conversation, I would love to uh, talk about data science within your organization, maybe how you want to bring better security and management uh, management to your data science team. Um, or maybe you're on the IT side of the house and you think that they, they need, uh, that, that they need better controls. And so I'm happy, more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. My email is Zach at zeppel.com, Z-A-C-K. Um, so please feel free to drop me a note. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please drop them into the Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jay. Elise, we, we lost your audio. I was wondering if that was just me. I have to say, Zach, I'm a little jealous of your email. I was a little too late at Snowflake to get to Sander at Snowflake.com. Snowflake, as well as other databases. Can I connect Zeppel to other databases as well? Elise, will you repeat the question? Your audio dropped yeah. off. <laughs> sure. No, <laughs> yes. Um, so somebody said, um, we use Snowflake as well as other databases. Can I connect Zeppel to other databases as well? Sure. I'll take that one. Um, so there are a number of, where, wherever your data lives, we can always access, uh, we can always access that data. And there are a number of different uh, use cases that I've seen even where where teams are, are wanting to take data from other data sources and move that into Snowflake as their central data warehouse. Um, and then that same, on, on top of that, we have that same level of, of, of access or secure access and that, that Jonathan showed you with the Snowflake data source um, with, with other data sources as well. 
like S3, JDBC connections, Postgres, um, and, and a number of other ones that, that, that might be out there, like uh, I'm just thinking a few off the top, Redshift and Athena. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to connect to data and we provide those secure methods through our data source access, um, very similar to the Snowflake one that Jonathan had shared. So uh, we've got a new question in there. Uh, so uh, someone asks, are these security features available no matter the cloud or the identity provider? Um, I'll answer on the Snowflake side. Um, for us, that answer is yes. Um, so everything that I showed here today, um, I used Okta, for example, but um, you can use Ping, you can use um, Azure AD, you can use uh, simple SAML PHP, you can use um, anything that's SAML 2.0 compliant to achieve what we saw today. Um, and the, uh, the OAuth part actually was all Snowflake. So um, that's just Snowflake required to get that part done. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the Zeppel side, um, you know, as long we, we can integrate with, with a number of different identity providers and um, the method that you saw Jonathan go through for Okta um, is any any provider that supports OpenID Connect. Um, that was the method that that we had running through there, and then we we also support a, a number of different methods as well around Google and and CAS and and then um, standard uh, user pass um, authentication. You know, and shame on me, I missed part of the answer to that question. We also asked uh, the, the, the cloud involved and, uh, you know, Snowflake runs on three different cloud service providers, uh, AWS, Azure, and GCP, and everything we showed is fully supported on all of those as well. Great. This, we had a question, actually, it's, it's two questions that sort of are on the opposite ends of the scale spectrum. So one uh, question is, we have a small data science team of three data scientists. Would Zeppel be a good option for us? And then on the other side of the scale, um, we have hundreds of notebooks, and yes, many of them are stored on laptops. Is there a way to batch upload my notebooks into Zeppel? Sure, great, great question. Um, we work with different size teams of, of, of all size, right? From the single data scientist all the way up to hundreds of different consumers that that might be looking at or, or using these notebooks so whatever size team you have um, we can definitely support your your use case and oftentimes what i've seen is that data science teams will be maybe 10 to 20 to 30 strong but they'll have a lot of other stakeholders in the in the in the organization that will want to consume the information that the data science teams are producing, whether it's um, coming from our, our built-in charting editors uh, or whether it's sharing an entire notebook, uh, oftentimes there are other personas like your data engineers or your, 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 your data analysts that will, will want to be able to consume that information or maybe it's a far less technical user and it's just a report back to the business. So. Um, having a centralized platform for all of the work reports, notebooks to live and run uh, lends itself really well to scaling for whatever size team that you have. Um, and, and then I think there was a, sorry, there was a second part of the question around importing existing work. Uh, that's definitely something that, that we support. You know, we want you to bring in, uh, we're, we're not naive to think that everyone's starting fresh and we know that lots of data open source notebooks exist um, or a lot of existing code and notebooks exist. So we want to make it very easy to bring that in. So uh, it's, it's really easy to batch upload those, those, those notebooks or, or do a one off um, either way. Great. One more question is, um, is Zeppel available on the Snowflake Partner Connect? Um, we are, and you can with uh, just click on the Snowflake tile, we'll automatically spin up a free uh, Snowflake, uh, a free Zeppel trial for you and automatically connect to your Snowflake uh, data within just uh, about one minute. So I think that um, that wraps up our questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attendance. Um, and please feel free to reach out to um, Zach at Zeppel.com if you have any other uh, any other questions. And have a great day.
Thank you.